Grizzled, gnarled, and 59 years old, John Brown had for decades lived like a nomad, hauling his large family of 20 children across six states as he tried farming, raising sheep, selling wool, and running a tannery. But failure dogged him. Failure, however, had not budged his conviction that slavery was wrong and ought to be destroyed. In the wake of the fighting that erupted over the future of slavery in Kansas in the 1850s, his beliefs turned violent. On May 24, 1856, he led an eight-man anti-slavery posse in the midnight slaughter of five allegedly pro-slavery men at Pottawatomie, Kansas. He told Mahala Doyle, whose husband and two oldest sons he killed, that if a man stood between him and what he thought right, he would take that man's life as calmly as he would eat breakfast. After the killings, Brown slipped out of Kansas and reemerged in the East, where he begged money to support his vague plan for military operations against slavery. On the night of October 16, 1859, Brown took his war against slavery into the South. With only 21 men, including five African Americans, he invaded Harper's Ferry, Virginia. His band seized the town's armory and rifle works, but the invaders were immediately surrounded. When Brown refused to surrender, federal troops under Colonel Robert E. Lee charged with bayonets. Although a few of Brown's raiders escaped, federal forces killed ten of his men, including two of his sons, and captured seven, among them Brown. Months before the raid, Brown had claimed, When I strike, the bees will begin to swarm. As the slaves arrived, Brown said he would arm them and fight a war of liberation. Brown, however, neglected to inform the slaves when he had arrived in Harper's Ferry, and the few who knew of his arrival wanted nothing to do with his enterprise. White Southerners viewed Brown's raid as proof that Northerners actively incited slaves in bloody rebellion. Sectional tension was as old as the Constitution, but hostility had escalated with the outbreak of war with Mexico in May 1846. National expansion and the slavery issue intersected when Representative David Wilmot introduced a bill to prohibit slavery in any territory that might be acquired as a result of the war. After that, the problem of slavery in the territories became the principal wedge that divided the nation. Mexico is to us the forbidden fruit, South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun declared at the war's outset. The penalty of eating it is to subject our institutions to political death. For a decade and a half, the slavery issue intertwined with the fate of former Mexican land, poisoning the national political debate. Slavery proved powerful enough to transform party politics into sectional politics. Northerners and Southerners eyed one another hostily across the Mason-Dixon line. As the nation lurched from crisis to crisis, Southern disaffection and alienation mounted, and support for compromise eroded. The era began with a crisis of union and ended with the union in even greater peril. As Abraham Lincoln predicted in 1858, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Victory in the Mexican-American War brought vast new territories in the West into the United States. The gold rush of 1849 transformed the sleepy frontier of California into a booming economy. 1850 witnessed new rushes for gold in Colorado and silver in Nevada. It quickly became clear that Northerners and Southerners had very different visions of the West, particularly the place of slavery in its future. Politicians battled over whether to ban slavery from former Mexican land or permit it to expand to the Pacific. In 1850, Congress patched together a plan that Americans hoped would last. This plan for expansion envisioned stability only for the Anglo-Americans, however. American Indians in the West would soon see their traditional way of life assaulted. Most Americans agreed that the Constitution left the issue of slavery to the individual states to decide. Northern states had done away with slavery, while southern states had retained it. But what about slavery in the nation's territories? The Constitution states that Congress shall have power to make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory belonging to the United States. The debate about slavery, then, turned toward Congress. The spark for the national debate appeared in August 1846, when a Democratic representative from Pennsylvania, David Wilmot, proposed that Congress bar slavery from all lands acquired in the war with Mexico. The Mexicans had abolished slavery in their country, and Wilmot declared, God forbid that we should be the means of planting this institution upon it. Regardless of party affiliation, 
Northerners lined up behind the Wilmot Proviso. They supported free soil, by which they meant territory in which slavery would be prohibited for several reasons. Some wanted to preserve the West for free labor, for hard-working, self-reliant free men, not for slaveholders and slaves. But support also came from those who were simply anti-South. New slave territories would eventually mean new slave states. Wilmot himself said his proposal would blunt the power of slaveholders in the national government. Additional support for free soil came from Northerners who were hostile to blacks and wanted to reserve new land for whites. It is no wonder that some called the Wilmot Proviso the white man's proviso. The thought that slavery might be excluded in the territories outraged white Southerners. Like Northerners, they regarded the West as a ladder for economic and social opportunity. They also believed that the exclusion of slavery was a slap in the face to Southern veterans of the Mexican-American War. In addition, Southern leaders sought to maintain equal political strength with the North to protect the South's interests, especially slavery. The need seemed especially urgent in the 1840s, when the North's population and wealth were booming. James Henry Hammond of South Carolina predicted that ten new states would be carved from the acquired Mexican land. If free soil won, the North would ride over us roughshod in Congress, he claimed. Our only safety is in equality of power. Foes of slavery's expansion and foes of slavery's exclusion squared off in the nation's capital. Because Northerners had a majority in the House, they easily passed the Wilmot Proviso. In the Senate, however, where slave states outnumbered free states 15 to 14, Southerners defeated it in 1847. Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina even denied that Congress had the constitutional authority to exclude slavery from the nation's territories. He argued that because the territories were the joint and common property of all the states, Congress could not bar citizens of one state from migrating with their property, including slaves, to the territories. Whereas Wilmot demanded that Congress slam shut the door to slavery, Calhoun declared that Congress must hold the door wide open. Senator Lewis Cass of Michigan offered a compromise. He proposed the doctrine of popular sovereignty by which people who settled the territories would decide for themselves slavery's fate. This solution, Cass argued, sat squarely in the American tradition of democracy and local self-government. It also offered a lack of clarity about the precise moment when settlers could determine slavery's fate. That gave popular sovereignty an advantage. Northern advocates believed that the decision on slavery could be made as soon as the first territorial legislature assembled. With free soil majorities likely because of the North's greater population, they would shut the door to slavery immediately. Southern supporters believed that popular sovereignty guaranteed that slavery would be unrestricted throughout the entire territorial period. Only when settlers in a territory drew up a constitution and applied for statehood could they decide the issue of slavery. By then, slavery would have sunk deep roots. As long as the matter of timing remained vague, Popular sovereignty gave hope to both sides. When Congress ended its session in 1848, no plan had won a majority in both houses. Northerners who demanded no new slave territory anywhere, ever, and Southerners who demanded entry for their slave property into all territories or else, staked out their positions. Unresolved in Congress, the territorial question naturally became an issue in the presidential election of 1848. When President Polk, worn out and ailing, chose not to seek re-election, the Democratic Convention nominated Lewis Cass of Michigan, the man most closely associated with popular sovereignty. The Whigs nominated a Mexican-American war hero, General Zachary Taylor, a man who had never voted and who had no known political opinions. The Whigs declined to adopt a party platform, betting that the combination of a military hero and total silence on the slavery issue would unite their divided party. Anti-slavery Whigs balked. Senator Charles Sumner called for a major political realignment, one grand northern party of freedom. In the summer of 1848, anti-slavery Whigs and anti-slavery Democrats founded the Free Soil Party, nominating a Democrat, Martin Van Buren for president, and a Whig, Charles Francis Adams, for vice president. The platform boldly proclaimed free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men. In the November election, free soilers did not carry a single state. 
Taylor won the all-important electoral vote 163 to 127, carrying eight of the 15 slave states and seven of the 15 free states. Wisconsin had entered the Union earlier in 1848 as the 15th free state. Northern voters were not yet ready for Sumner's one grand northern party of freedom, but the struggle over slavery in the territories had shaken the major parties badly. When Zachary Taylor entered the White House in March 1849, the new slaveholding president shocked the nation by championing a free soil solution to the Mexican session. Believing that he could avoid further sectional strife if California and New Mexico skipped the territorial stage, Taylor encouraged settlers to apply for admission to the Union as states. Predominantly anti-slavery, the settlers began writing free state constitutions. For the first time, Mississippi and Jefferson Davis lamented, we are about permanently to destroy the balance of power between the sections. Congress convened in December 1849, beginning one of the most contentious sessions in its history. President Taylor urged Congress to admit California as a free state immediately and to admit New Mexico, which lagged behind a few months, as soon as it applied. Southerners exploded. Into this rancorous scene stepped Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, the architect of union-saving compromises in the Missouri and nullification crises. Clay offered a series of resolutions meant to answer and balance all questions and controversy between the free states and slave states. Admit California as a free state, he proposed, but organize the rest of the Southwest without restrictions on slavery. Require Texas to abandon its claim to parts of New Mexico, but compensate it by assuming its pre-annexation debt. Abolish the domestic slave trade in Washington, D.C., but confirm slavery itself in the nation's capital. Affirm Congress's lack of authority to interfere with the interstate slave trade and enact a more effective fugitive slave law. Both anti-slavery advocates and so-called fire-eaters, as radical Southerners who urged secession from the Union were beginning to be called, savaged Clay's plan. Senator Salmon P. Chase of Ohio ridiculed it as sentiment for the North, substance for the South. Senator Henry S. Foote of Mississippi denounced it as more offensive to the South than the speeches of abolitionists William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and Frederick Douglass combined. The most frightening response came from Calhoun, who argued that the fragile political unity of North and South depended on continued equal representation in the Senate, which Clay's plan for a free California destroyed. As things now stand, he said in February 1850, the South cannot with safety remain in the Union. Like Clay, Massachusetts Senator Daniel Webster defended compromise. He told Northerners that the South had legitimate complaints, but he told Southerners that secession from the Union would mean civil war. He argued that the Wilmot Proviso's ban on slavery in the territories was reckless and unnecessary because the harsh climate effectively prohibited the expansion of cotton and slaves into the Southwest. Why then taunt Southerners with the Proviso? Free soil forces recoiled from what they saw as Webster's desertion. Senator William H. Seward of New York responded that Webster's and Clay's compromise with slavery was radically wrong and essentially vicious. Seward rejected Calhoun's argument that Congress lacked the constitutional authority to exclude slavery from the territories. In any case, he said, there was a higher law than the Constitution, the law of God, to ensure freedom in all the public domain. Claiming that God was a free soiler did nothing to cool the superheated political atmosphere. In May 1850, the Senate considered a bill that joined Clay's resolutions into a single comprehensive package. Clay bet that a majority of Congress wanted compromise and that the members would vote for the package, even though it contained provisions they disliked. But the strategy backfired. Free Soilers and pro-slavery Southerners voted down the comprehensive plan. Fortunately for those who favored a settlement, Senator Stephen A. Douglas, a rising Democratic star from Illinois, broke the bill into its parts and skillfully ushered each through Congress. The agreement Douglas won in September 1850 was very much the one Clay had proposed in January. California entered the Union as a free state. New Mexico and Utah became territories where popular sovereignty would decide slavery's fate. 
Texas accepted its boundary with New Mexico and received $10 million from the federal government. Congress ended the slave trade in the District of Columbia, but enacted a more stringent fugitive slave law. In September, Millard Fillmore, who had become president when Zachary Taylor died in July, signed into law each bill collectively known as the Compromise of 1850. The nation breathed a sigh of relief, for the Compromise preserved the Union and peace for the moment. The Compromise of 1850 began to come apart almost immediately. Surprisingly, the cause was not slavery in the territories, the crux of the disagreement, but runaway slaves in New England, a neglected part of the settlement. The issue of runaway slaves was as old as the Constitution, which contained a provision for the return of any person held to service or labor in one state who escaped to another. In 1793, a federal law gave muscle to the provision by authorizing slave owners to enter other states to recapture their slave property. Proclaiming the 1793 law a license to kidnap free blacks, northern states in the 1830s began passing personal liberty laws that provided fugitives with some protection. Some northern communities also formed vigilance committees to help runaways. Each year, a few hundred slaves escaped into free states and found friendly northern conductors who put them aboard the Underground Railroad which was not a railroad at all, of course, but a series of secret stations or hideouts on the way to Canada. Harriet Tubman, an escaped slave from Maryland, returned more than a dozen times and guided more than 300 slaves to freedom in this way. Furious about northern interference, Southerners in 1850 insisted on the stricter fugitive slave law that was part of the Compromise. According to the Fugitive Slave Act, to seize an alleged slave, a slaveholder simply had to appear before a commissioner and swear that the runaway was his. The commissioner earned $10 for every individual returned to slavery, but only $5 for those set free. Most galling to Northerners, the law expected all citizens to assist officials in apprehending runaways. That required Northerners to become slave catchers. The northern free states had gradually passed laws requiring free blacks to carry freedom papers certified by a magistrate and backed by a respectable white man who served as a sort of patron. Prior to 1850, slave hunters were often arrested as vagrants or disturbers of the peace, but now they could move about freely to pursue their quarry. If unable to find the runaway they were contracted to catch, they would often seize a free African American and simply declare him or her to be the runaway they were looking for. When shown freedom papers, the slave catchers would simply destroy them and claim such documents never existed. Resorting to one's patron or sponsor proved dicey, since anyone convicted of aiding or abetting runaway slaves faced serious felony charges, and often these sponsors withdrew. This effectively meant open season on free blacks, especially in border states. But just as often, white northerners stepped forward as allies. In Boston in February 1851, an angry crowd overpowered federal marshals and snatched a runaway named Shadrach from a courtroom, put him on the Underground Railroad, and whisked him off to Canada. Three years later, when another Boston crowd rushed the courthouse in a failed attempt to rescue runaway Anthony Burns, a guard was shot dead. To white Southerners, the fanatics of the higher law creed had whipped Northerners into a frenzy of massive resistance. Actually, the overwhelming majority of fugitives claimed by slaveholders were re-enslaved peacefully. But brutal enforcement of the unpopular law had a radicalizing effect in the North, particularly in New England. To Southerners, Northerners had betrayed the Compromise and the Constitution. The spectacle of shackled African Americans being herded south seared the conscience of every Northerner who witnessed such a scene. But far more Northerners were turned against slavery by a novel. Harriet Beecher Stowe, a white Northerner who had never set foot on a plantation, made the South's slaves into flesh-and-blood human beings almost more real than life. A member of a famous clan of preachers, teachers, and reformers, Stowe despised the slave catchers and wrote to expose the sin of slavery. Published as a book in 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, became a blockbuster hit, selling 300,000 copies in its first year and more than 2 million copies within 10 years.
The book was not only a sensation in the North, but became an international bestseller, shining an uncomfortable spotlight on the United States. Although it is impossible to measure precisely the impact of a novel on public opinion, Uncle Tom's Cabin helped to crystallize Northern sentiment against slavery and to confirm white Southerners' suspicions that they no longer received any sympathy in the free states. Other writers, ex-slaves who knew life in slave cabins firsthand, also produced stinging indictments of slavery. Solomon Northrop's compelling 12 Years a Slave sold 27,000 copies in two years, and the previously published narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass as told by himself eventually sold more than 30,000 copies. As the 1852 election approached, the Democrats and Whigs sought to close the sectional rifts that had opened within their parties. For their presidential nominee, the Democrats turned to Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire. Pierce's well-known sympathy with Southern views caused his Northern critics to include him among the Doe Faces, Northern men malleable enough to champion Southern causes. The Whigs chose another Mexican-American war hero, General Winfield Scott of Virginia. But the Whigs' northern and southern factions were hopelessly divided, and the Democrat Pierce carried 27 states to Scott's four and won the Electoral College vote 254 to 42. The Free Soil Party lost almost half of the voters who had turned to it in the tumultuous political atmosphere of 1848. Eager to leave the sectional controversy behind, the new president turned swiftly to foreign expansion. Manifest destiny remained robust. Pierce's major objective was Cuba, which was owned by Spain and in which slavery flourished. But when anti-slavery northerners blocked Cuba's acquisition to keep more slave territory from entering the Union, Pierce turned to Mexico. In 1853, Diplomat James Gadsden negotiated a $10 million purchase of some 30,000 square miles of land in present-day Arizona and New Mexico. The Gadsden purchase furthered the dream of a transcontinental railroad to California and Pierce's desire for a southern route through Mexican territory. Talk of a railroad ignited rivalries in cities from New Orleans to Chicago as they maneuvered to become the eastern terminus. Inevitably, in the 1850s, the contest for a transcontinental railroad became a sectional struggle over slavery. Illinois Democratic Senator Stephen A. Douglas badly wanted the transcontinental railroad for Chicago. Any railroad that ran west from Chicago would pass through a region that Congress in 1830 had designated a permanent Indian reserve. Douglas proposed giving this vast area between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains an Indian name, Nebraska, and then throw any Indians out. Once the region achieved territorial status, whites could survey and sell the land, establish a civil government, and build the railroad. Nebraska lay within the Louisiana Purchase and, according to the Missouri Compromise of 1820, was closed to slavery. Douglas needed Southern votes to pass his Nebraska legislation, but Southerners had no incentive to create another free territory or to help a Northern city win the Transcontinental Railroad. Southerners, however, agreed to help if Congress organized Nebraska according to popular sovereignty. That meant giving slavery a chance in Nebraska territory and reopening the dangerous issue of slavery's expansion. In January 1854, Douglas introduced his bill to organize Nebraska Territory, leaving to the settlers themselves the decision about slavery. At Southern insistence, and even though he knew it would raise a hell of a storm, Douglas added an explicit repeal of the Missouri Compromise. Free Soilers branded Douglas's plan a gross violation of a sacred pledge and an atrocious plot to transform free land into a dreary region of despotism inhabited by masters and slaves. Undaunted, in 1854, Douglas skillfully shepherded the explosive bill through Congress. Nine-tenths of the Southern members, Whigs and Democrats, and half of the Northern Democrats cast votes in favor of the bill. Like Douglas, most Northern supporters believed that popular sovereignty would make Nebraska free territory. The Kansas-Nebraska Act divided the huge territory in two, Nebraska and Kansas. With this act, the government pushed the Plains Indians farther west, making way for farmers and railroads. Since the early 1830s, 
Whigs and Democrats had organized and channeled political conflict in the nation. This party system dampened sectionalism and strengthened the Union. To achieve national political power, the Whigs and Democrats had to retain strength in both the North and South. Strong Northern and Southern wings required that each party compromise and find positions acceptable to both sections. The 1850 Compromise and the Kansas-Nebraska Controversy shattered this stabilizing political system. In place of two national parties with bisectional strength, the mid-1850s witnessed the development of one party heavily dominated by one section and another party entirely limited to the other section. Rather than national parties, the country had what one critic disdainfully called geographic parties, a development that thwarted political compromise between the sections. As early as the Mexican-American War, members of the Whig Party had clashed over the future of slavery in annexed Mexican lands. By 1852, the Whig Party could please its pro-slavery southern wing or its anti-slavery northern wing, but not both. The Whigs' miserable showing in the election of 1852 made it clear that they were no longer a strong national party. By 1856, after more than two decades of contesting the Democrats, they were hardly a party at all. The collapse of the Whig Party left the Democrats as the country's only national party. Popular sovereignty provided a doctrine that many Democrats could support. Even so, popular sovereignty very nearly undid the party. When Stephen Douglas applied the doctrine to the part of the Louisiana Purchase where slavery had been barred, he divided Northern Democrats and destroyed the dominance of the Democratic Party in the free states. After 1854, the Democrats were a Southern-dominated party. Still, gains in the South more than balanced Democratic losses in the North, and during the 1850s, Democrats elected two presidents and won majorities in Congress in almost every election. The breakup of the Whigs and the disaffection of many Northern Democrats set millions of Americans politically adrift. Americans found that the death of the old party system created a multitude of fresh political harbors. Dozens of new political organizations vied for voters' attention. Out of the confusion, two emerged as true contenders. One grew out of the slavery controversy, a coalition of indignant anti-slavery Northerners. The other arose from an entirely different split in American society between native Protestants and Roman Catholic immigrants. The wave of immigrants that arrived in America from 1845 to 1855 produced a nasty backlash among Protestant Americans who feared that the Republic was about to drown in a sea of Roman Catholics from Ireland and German Protestants who nevertheless did not speak English. Nativists, individuals who were anti-immigrant, began to organize, first into secret societies, and then in 1854 into a political party made up of hardline former Whigs. Recruits swore never to vote for either foreign-born or Roman Catholic candidates and not to reveal any information about the organization. When questioned, they would say, I know nothing. Officially, they were the American Party, but most Americans called them the Know-Nothings. The Know Nothings enjoyed dazzling success in 1854 and 1856. They captured state legislatures throughout the nation and claimed dozens of seats in Congress. Democrats and Whigs described the Know Nothings' phenomenal record as a tornado, a hurricane, and a freak of political insanity. But by 1855, an observer might reasonably have concluded that the Know Nothings had emerged as the successor to the Whigs. The Know Nothings were not the only new party making noise, however. One of the new anti-slavery organizations provoked by the Kansas-Nebraska Act called itself the Republican Party. The Republicans attempted to unite all those who opposed the extension of slavery into any territory of the United States. The Republican creed tapped into the basic beliefs and values of Northerners. Slavery, Republicans believed, degraded the dignity of white labor by associating work with blacks and servility. Republicans warned that the insatiable slaveholders of the South, whom anti-slavery northerners called the slave power, were conspiring through their control of the Democratic Party to expand slavery, subvert liberty, and undermine the Constitution. Only by restricting slavery to the South, Republicans believed, could free labor flourish elsewhere. Without slavery, 
Western territories would provide vast economic opportunity for free white men. Powerful images of liberty and opportunity attracted a wide range of Northerners to the Republican cause. Women as well as men rushed to the new Republican Party. Indeed, three women helped found the party in Wisconsin in 1854. Although they could not vote and suffered from other legal handicaps, women nevertheless participated in politics by writing campaign literature, marching in parades, giving speeches, and lobbying voters. Women's anti-slavery fervor attracted them to the Republican Party, and participation in party politics in turn nurtured the women's rights movement. Susan B. Anthony, who attended Republican meetings throughout the 1850s, found that her political activity made her disfranchisement all the more frustrating. She and other women in the North worked on behalf of anti-slavery and women's suffrage and the right of married women to control their own property. The election of 1856 revealed that the Republicans had become the Democrats' main challenger and slavery in the territories, not immigration, was the election's principal issue. When the Know-Nothings insisted on a platform that endorsed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, most Northerners walked out. The Know-Nothings who remained nominated ex-president Millard Fillmore. The Republican platform focused mostly on making every territory free. When they labeled slavery a relic of barbarism, they signaled that they had written off the South. For president, they nominated the soldier and California adventurer John C. Fremont. Fremont lacked political credentials, but his wife, Jessie Fremont, the daughter of Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri, knew the political map well. Though careful to maintain a proper public image, the energetic young mother and anti-slavery defender helped attract voters and draw women into politics. The Democrats, successful in 1852 in bridging sectional differences by nominating a northern man with southern principles, chose another doe face, James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. They portrayed the Republicans as extremists, black Republican abolitionists, for example, whose support for the Wilmot Proviso risked pushing the South out of the Union. The Democratic strategy carried the day for Buchanan, who won 174 electoral votes against Fremont's 114 and Fillmore's 8. But the big news was that the Republicans, campaigning under the banner Free Soil, Free Men, Fremont, carried all but five of the states north of the Mason-Dixon line. Sectionalism had fashioned a new party system, one that spelled danger for the Democrats and the nation. Indeed, war had already broken out between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces in the distant Kansas Territory. Events in Kansas Territory in the mid-1850s underscored the Republicans' contention that the slaveholding South presented a profound threat to American freedoms. Kansas reeled with violence that Republicans argued was Southern in origin. Republicans also pointed to the brutal beating by a Southerner of a respected Northern senator on the floor of Congress. Even the Supreme Court, in the Republicans' view, reflected the South's drive toward minority rule and tyranny. Then, in 1858, the issues dividing North and South received an extraordinary hearing in a senatorial contest in Illinois when the nation's foremost Democrat debated an up-and-coming Republican. Three days after the House of Representatives approved the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, Senator William H. Seward of New York declared, Come on, then, gentlemen of the slave states, since there is no escaping your challenge, I accept it on behalf of the cause of freedom. We will engage in competition for the virgin soil of Kansas, and God give the victory to the side which is stronger in numbers as it is in right. Because of Stephen Douglas, popular sovereignty would determine whether Kansas became slave or free. Free state and slave state settlers each sought a majority at the ballot box, claimed God's blessing, and kept their rifles ready. Immigrant aid societies sprang up to promote settlement from free states or slave states, Missourians especially thought it important to secure Kansas for slavery. Thousands of rough frontiersmen, egged on by Missouri Senator David Rice Atchison, invaded Kansas. Not surprisingly, pro-slavery candidates swept the territorial elections in November 1854. When Kansas's first territorial legislature met, it enacted a raft of pro-slavery laws, including one prohibiting anti-slavery men from holding office or serving on juries. 
President Pierce endorsed the work of the fraudulently elected legislature. Free Soil Kansans did not. They elected their own legislature, which promptly banned both slaves and free blacks from the territory. Organized into two rival governments and armed to the teeth, Kansas verged on civil war. Fighting broke out on the morning of May 21, 1856, when several hundred pro-slavery men raided the town of Lawrence, the center of free state settlement. Only one man died, but the Sack of Lawrence, as Free Soil Forces called it, inflamed northern opinion. Elsewhere in Kansas, news of events in Lawrence provoked John Brown, a Free Soil settler, to announce that it was better that a score of bad men should die than that one man who came here to make Kansas a free state should be driven out and to lead the posse that massacred five allegedly pro-slavery settlers along Pottawatomie Creek. Just as bleeding Kansas gave the fledgling Republican Party fresh ammunition for its battle against the slave power, so too did an event that occurred in the national capital. In May 1856, Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts delivered a speech titled The Crime Against Kansas, which included a scathing personal attack on South Carolina Senator Andrew P. Butler. Preston Brooks, a young South Carolina member of the House and a kinsman of Butler's, felt compelled to defend the honor of his aged relative. On May 22nd, Brooks entered the Senate where he found Sumner working at his desk. He beat Sumner over the head with his walking stick until Sumner lay bleeding and unconscious on the floor. Brooks resigned his seat in the House, only to be promptly re-elected. In the meantime, Southerners from all over the region mailed him new walking sticks, some of them emblazoned with the names of other Northern Senators and Congressmen. In the North, the Southern hero became a villain. Like Bleeding Kansas, Bleeding Sumner provided the Republican Party with a potent symbol of the South's twisted and violent civilization. Political debate over slavery in the territories became heated in part because the Constitution lacked precision on the issue. In 1857, in the case of Dred Scott v. Samford, the Supreme Court announced its understanding of the meaning of the Constitution regarding slavery in the territories. The Court's decision demonstrated that it had not escaped the sectional and partisan passions that were convulsing the land. In 1833, an army doctor bought the slave Dred Scott in St. Louis, Missouri, and took him as his personal servant to Fort Armstrong, Illinois, and then to Fort Snelling in Minnesota Territory. In the meantime, Scott met and married a woman and had a few children. Brought back to St. Louis in 1846, Scott, with the help of white friends, sued for his freedom on the grounds that he and his family had lived legally in a free state and therefore entitled to their freedom. Scott argued that living in Illinois, a free state, in Minnesota, a free territory, had made him and his family free and that they remained free even after returning to Missouri, a slave state. In 1857, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, who hated Republicans and detested racial equality, wrote the court's Dred Scott decision. First, the court ruled that Scott could not legally claim violation of his constitutional rights because he was not a citizen of the United States. When the Constitution was written, Taney wrote, blacks had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Second, the laws of Dred Scott's home state, Missouri, determined his status, and thus his travels in free areas did not make him free. Third, the Constitution gives Congress the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. And this did not include the right to prohibit slavery. The court explicitly declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional, even though the Kansas-Nebraska Act had already voided it. The Taney Court's extreme pro-slavery decision outraged Republicans. By denying the federal government the right to exclude slavery in the territories, it cut the legs out from under the Republican Party. As the New York Tribune lamented, 
the decision cleared the way for all our territories to be ripened into slave states. Particularly frightening to African Americans in the North was the court's declaration that free blacks were not citizens and had no rights. The Republican rebuttal to the Dred Scott ruling relied heavily on the dissenting opinion of Justice Benjamin R. Curtis. Scott was a citizen of the United States, Curtis argued. At the time of the writing of the Constitution, free black men could vote in five states and participated in the ratification process. Scott was free because slavery was prohibited in Minnesota. The involuntary servitude of a slave coming into the territory with his master should cease to exist. The Missouri Compromise was constitutional. The founders had meant exactly what they said. Congress had the power to make all needful rules and regulations for the territories, including barring slavery. Unmoved by Curtis's dissent, the court, in a 7-2 to two decision, validated an extreme statement of the South's territorial rights. John C. Calhoun's claim that Congress had no authority to exclude slavery became the law of the land. White Southerners cheered. Ironically, the Dred Scott decision actually strengthened the young Republican Party. Indeed, that outrageous decision, one Republican argued, was the best thing that could have happened, for it provided powerful evidence of the Republicans' claim that a hostile slave power conspired against Northern liberties. By reigniting the sectional flames, the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 and the Dred Scott case in 1857 provided Republican politicians with fresh challenges and fresh opportunities. Abraham Lincoln, convinced that slavery was a monstrous injustice, condemned the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 for giving slavery a new life and in 1856 joined the Republican Party. He accepted that the Constitution permitted slavery in those states where it existed, but he believed that Congress could contain its spread. Lincoln envisioned the Western territories as places for poor people to go to and better their conditions. But slavery's expansion threatened free men's opportunity. The Dred Scott decision, which denied Congress's right to ban slavery in the territories, persuaded him that slaveholders were engaged in a dangerous conspiracy to nationalize slavery. The next step, Lincoln warned, would be another Supreme Court decision declaring that the Constitution of the United States does not permit a state to exclude slavery from its limits. Unless the citizens of Illinois woke up, he warned, the Supreme Court would make Illinois a slave state. Republicans could even point to evidence that Southerners sought to spread slavery beyond the nation's borders. In the 1850s, thousands of Americans became filibusters, adventurers who joined private armies that invaded foreign countries throughout the Western Hemisphere. Increasingly, filibusters were Southerners and pro-slavery. The most successful of all filibusters was William Walker of Tennessee, who in 1855 invaded Nicaragua, became president, legalized slavery, and called on Southerners to come raise cotton, sugar, and coffee in a magnificent country. Filibusters confirmed Republicans' view of Southerners as dangerous cutthroats willing to do anything to expand slavery. In Lincoln's view, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Either opponents of slavery would arrest its spread and place it on the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates would see that it became legal in all the states old as well as new, north as well as south. Lincoln's convictions that slavery was wrong and that Congress must stop its spread formed the core of the Republican ideology. In 1858, Republicans in Illinois chose him to challenge the nation's premier Democrat who was seeking re-election to the U.S. Senate. When Stephen Douglas learned that the Republican Abraham Lincoln would be his opponent for the Senate, he observed, He is the strong man of the party, full of wit, facts, dates, and the best stump speaker with his droll ways and dry jokes in the West. He is as honest as he is shrewd. Not only did Douglas have to contend with a formidable foe, but during the previous year, the nation had experienced a sharp economic downturn, the Panic of 1857. Thousands of businesses had failed and many were unemployed. As a Democrat, Douglas had to go before the voters as a member of the party whose policies stood accused of causing the panic. 
Douglas's response to another crisis in 1857, however, helped shore up his standing in Illinois. Pro-slavery forces in Kansas met in the town of Lecompton, drafted the pro-slavery constitution, and applied for statehood. Everyone knew that free soilers outnumbered pro-slavery settlers, but President Buchanan instructed Congress to admit Kansas as the 16th slave state. Senator Douglas broke with the Democratic administration and denounced the Lecompton Constitution. Congress killed the Lecompton Bill. When Kansas reconsidered the Lecompton Constitution in an honest election, they rejected it 6-1. to one. Kansas entered the Union in 1861 as a free state. By denouncing the fraudulent pro-slavery Constitution, Douglas declared his independence from the South and, he hoped, made himself acceptable at home. A relative unknown and a decided underdog in the Illinois election, Lincoln challenged Douglas to debate him face to face. The two met in seven communities for what would become a legendary series of debates. To the thousands who stood straining to see and hear, they must have seemed an odd pair. Douglas was five feet four inches tall, broad and stocky. Lincoln was six foot four, angular and lean. Douglas was in perpetual motion darting across the platform, shouting and jabbing the air. Lincoln stood still and spoke deliberately. Douglas wore the latest fashion and dazzled audiences with his flashy vests. Lincoln wore good suits but managed to look rumpled anyway. The two men debated the crucial issues of the age, slavery and freedom. Lincoln badgered Douglas with the question of whether he favored the spread of slavery. He tried to force Douglas into the damaging admission that the Supreme Court had repudiated Douglas's own territorial solution, popular sovereignty. At Freeport, Illinois, Douglas admitted that settlers could not now pass legislation barring slavery, but he argued that they could ban slavery just as effectively by not passing protective laws, such as those found in slave states. Southerners condemned Douglas's Freeport doctrine and charged him with trying to steal the victory they had gained with the Dred Scott decision. Lincoln chastised his opponent for his don't-care attitude about slavery, for blowing out the moral lights around us. Douglas worked the racial issue. He called Lincoln an abolitionist and a racial egalitarian. Lincoln held what were moderate racial views for his time, but put on the defensive, he reaffirmed his faith in white rule. I will say, then, that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black race. Lincoln tried to steer the debate back to what he considered the true issue, the morality and future of slavery. Slavery is wrong, Lincoln repeated, because a man has the right to the fruits of his own labor. As Douglas predicted, the election was hard fought and closely contested. Until the adoption of the 17th Amendment in 1911, citizens voted for state legislators who in turn selected U.S. Senators. Since Democrats won a slight majority in the Illinois legislature, the members returned Douglas to the Senate. But the Lincoln-Douglas debates thrust Lincoln, the Prairie Republican, into the national spotlight. Republicans believed that they had irrefutable evidence of the South's aggressive promotion of slavery. White Southerners, of course, saw things differently. They were the ones who were under siege, they declared. They believed that Northerners were itching to use their numerical advantage to attack slavery and not just in the territories. Republicans had made it clear that they were unwilling to accept the Dred Scott ruling as the last word on the issue of slavery expansion. And John Brown's attempt to incite a slave insurrection in Virginia in 1859 proved to Southerners that Northerners would do anything to end slavery. Talk of leaving the Union had been heard for years, but until the final crisis, Southerners had used secession as a ploy to gain concessions within the Union, not to destroy it. Then the 1850s delivered powerful blows to Southerners' confidence that they could remain in the Union and protect slavery. When the Republican Party won the White House in 1860, many Southerners concluded that they would have to leave. John Brown earned a fearsome reputation as a violent crusader against slavery in bleeding Kansas, making no distinction between pro-slavery militants and others who were pro-slavery but did not take up arms against him. A failure in everything he had tried to do in life, he found inspiration as a righteous Christian tapped by God to slaughter pro-slavery men. 
Once clean-shaven and with a tight Republican hairstyle, he grew out his beard to look the part of an Old Testament prophet and preferred to use a sword to kill his foes than a gun, reveling in the pain he inflicted on his victims. It was all justified in what he believed was a war against slavery, but killing pro-slavery in Kansans was not enough. He claimed that God had called him to lead a general uprising of all slaves against slaveholding whites and their political supporters. In the late summer of 1859, with his sons and a small group of men who were part of his partisan army in Kansas, Brown traveled to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., in order to seize the large federal armory located there. Along the way, he picked up a handful of free blacks and runaway slaves, and in mid-October, they managed to overwhelm the small garrison guarding the facility. Some of the soldiers were killed, while the rest were taken hostage. U.S. Army forces converged on the armory, led by Colonel Robert E. Lee, and proceeded to besiege Brown and his men, who holed up in the engine house. Attempts at a negotiated surrender failed, and there was a short firefight before Lee ordered a full assault on the engine house, during which Brown was wounded and two of his sons and several others of his men were killed. One of Brown's sons managed to escape along with a few others, but John Brown was taken alive. John Brown stood trial for treason, murder, and incitement of slave insurrection. Brown told his wife that he was determined to make the utmost possible out of a defeat. He said to the court, If it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. Brown was found guilty and sentenced to hang on December 2, 1859. On the way to the gallows, he handed his guard a note that read, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think vainly, flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. After Brown's execution, Americans across the land contemplated the meaning of his life and death. Some Northerners celebrated his martyrdom. Ralph Waldo Emerson likened Brown to Christ when he declared that Brown made the gallows as glorious as the cross. Most Northerners did not advocate bloody rebellion, however. Like Lincoln, they concluded that Brown's noble anti-slavery ideals could not excuse violence, bloodshed, and treason. Nathaniel Hawthorne quipped that no man was more justly executed. Still, when northern churches marked John Brown's hanging with tolling bells and prayer vigils, white southerners contemplated what they had in common with people who regard John Brown as a martyr and a Christian hero. When the Democrats converged on Charleston for their convention in April 1860, Fire-eating Southerners denounced Stephen Douglas and demanded a platform that included federal protection of slavery in the territories, a goal of extreme pro-slavery Southerners for years. They distrusted Douglas simply for being a Northerner. At this point, all Southern pro-slavery agitators determined that every Northerner was not just anti-slavery, but a radical Garrisonian abolitionist a conviction that was not at all true, but nevertheless, their perception was their reality. When the delegates to the convention approved a platform with popular sovereignty, representatives from the entire Lower South and Arkansas stomped out of the convention. The remaining Democrats adjourned to meet a few weeks later in Baltimore, where they nominated Douglas for president. When bolting Southern Democrats reconvened, they approved a platform with a federal slave code and nominated Vice President John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. Southern moderates, however, refused to support Breckinridge. They formed the Constitutional Union Party to provide voters with a unionist choice. Instead of adopting a platform and confronting the slavery question, the Constitutional Union Party merely approved a vague resolution pledging to recognize no political principle other than the Constitution the Union, and the enforcement of the laws. For president, they nominated former Senator John Bell of Tennessee. The Republicans smelled victory, but they needed to carry nearly all the free states to win. To make their party more appealing, 
they expanded their platform beyond anti-slavery. They hoped that free homesteads, a protective tariff, a transcontinental railroad, and a guarantee of immigrant political rights would provide an agenda broad enough to unify the North. While reasserting their commitment to stop the spread of slavery, they also denounced John Brown's raid as among the gravest of crimes and confirmed the security of slavery in the South. The foremost Republican, William H. Seward, had made enemies with his radical higher law doctrine, which claimed that there was a higher moral law than the Constitution, and with his irrepressible conflict speech in which he declared that North and South were fated to collide. Lincoln, however, since bursting onto the national scene in 1858, had demonstrated his clear purpose, good judgment, and solid Republican credentials. That and his residence in Illinois, a crucial state, made him attractive to the party. On the third ballot, the delegates chose Lincoln. Defeated by Douglas in a state contest less than two years earlier, Lincoln now stood ready to take him on for the presidency. The election of 1860 was like none other in American politics. It took place in the midst of the nation's severest crisis. Four major candidates crowded the presidential field. Rather than a four-cornered contest, however, the election broke into two contests, each with two candidates. In the North, Lincoln faced Douglas. In the South, Breckinridge confronted Bell. So outrageous did Southerners consider the Republican Party that they did not even permit Lincoln's name to appear on the ballot in 10 of the 15 slave states. On November 6, 1860, Lincoln swept all of the 18 free states except New Jersey, which split its electoral votes between him and Douglas. Although Lincoln only received 39% of the popular vote, he won easily in the Electoral College with 180 votes, 28 more than he needed for victory. Lincoln did not win because his opposition was splintered. Even if the votes of his three opponents had been combined, Lincoln still would have won. He won because his votes were concentrated in the free states, which contained a majority of electoral votes. Ominously, however, Breckinridge, running on a Southern rights platform, won the entire Lower South plus Delaware, Maryland, and North Carolina. Anxious Southerners immediately began debating what to do. Although Breckinridge had carried the South, a vote for Southern rights was not necessarily a vote for secession. Besides, Slightly more than half of the Southerners who had voted had cast ballots for Douglas and Bell, two stout defenders of the Union. Southern Unionists tried to calm the fears that Lincoln's election triggered. Former Congressman Alexander Stevens of Georgia asked what Lincoln had done to justify something as extreme as secession. Had he not promised to respect slavery where it existed? In Stevens' judgment, secession might lead to war, which would possibly open the door to slave insurrection. Secessionists emphasized the dangers of delay. Why wait for abolitionists to attack? As for war, there would be none. The Union was a voluntary compact, and Lincoln would not coerce loyalty from Southerners. If Northerners did resist with force, secessionists argued, one Southern woodsman could whip five of Lincoln's greasy mechanics. The prospect of an actual civil war was too awful for most to contemplate, and they strove to downplay such a possibility. One Southern politician promised to wipe up any and all blood shed over secession with a handkerchief. For all their differences, Southern whites agreed that they had to defend slavery. They disagreed about whether the mere presence of a Republican in the White House made it necessary to exercise what they considered a legitimate right to secede. Bear in mind that this was not the first time a section of the country pondered secession. The New England states considered it near the end of the War of 1812, and politicians there read a key part of the Constitution in the same way that the Southerners now did in 1860. Article 1, Section 10 never addresses the issue of a state or block of states leaving the Union but simply states that behaving independently, either individually or as a group, at the expense of the Union, is forbidden. The debate about what to do was briefest in South Carolina, which seceded from the Union on December 20, 1860. By February 1861, the six other lower South states followed in South Carolina's footsteps. In general, slaveholders spearheaded secession, 
While non-slaveholders in the Piedmont and Mountain counties, where slaves were relatively few, displayed the greatest attachment to the Union. In February, representatives from South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas met in Montgomery, Alabama, where they created the Confederate States of America. Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis became president, and Alexander Stevens of Georgia, who had spoken so eloquently about the dangers of revolution, became vice president. In March 1861, Stevens declared that the Confederacy's cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world, based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Lincoln's election had split the Union. Now secession split the South. Seven slave states seceded during the winter, but the eight slave states of the Upper South rejected secession, at least for the moment. The Upper South had a smaller stake in slavery. Barely half as many white families in the Upper South held slaves as in the Lower South. Slaves represented twice as large a percentage of the population in the Lower South as in the Upper South. Consequently, whites in the Upper South had fewer fears that Republican ascendancy meant economic catastrophe, social chaos, and racial war. Lincoln would need to do more than just be elected to provoke them into secession. The nation had to wait until March 4, 1861, when Lincoln took office, to see what he would do. Presidents-elect waited four months to take office until 1933, when the 20th Amendment to the Constitution shifted the inauguration to January 20th. He chose to stay in Springfield after his election and to say nothing. Lame duck President James Buchanan sat in Washington and did nothing. Congress's efforts at cobbling together a peace-saving compromise came to nothing. Lincoln began his inaugural address with reassurances to the South. He had no lawful right to interfere with slavery where it already existed, he declared again, adding for emphasis that he had no inclination to do so. Conciliatory about slavery in the South, Lincoln proved inflexible about the Union. The Union, he declared, was perpetual, although that language is not in the Constitution. Secession was anarchy and legally void, therefore interpreting Article I, Section 10 slightly differently. The Constitution required him to execute the law in all the states. The decision for war or peace rested in the South's hands, Lincoln said. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. As their economies, societies, and cultures diverged in the 19th century, Northerners and Southerners expressed different concepts of the American promise and the place of slavery within it. Their differences crystallized into political form in 1846, when David Wilmot proposed banning slavery in any territory won in the Mexican-American War. Discovery of gold and other precious metals in the West added urgency to the controversy over slavery in the territories. Congress attempted to address the issue with the Compromise of 1850, but the Fugitive Slave Act and the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin hardened Northern sentiments against slavery and confirmed Southern suspicions of Northern ill will. The bloody violence that erupted in Kansas in 1856 and the incendiary Dred Scott decision the following year further eroded hope for a solution to this momentous question. During the extended crisis of the Union that stretched from 1846 to 1861, the traditional Whig and Democratic parties struggled to hold together as new parties, most notably the Republican Party, emerged. Politicians fixed their attention on the expansion of slavery, but from the beginning Americans recognized that the controversy had less to do with slavery in the territories than with the future of slavery in the nation. For more than 70 years, statesmen had found compromises that accepted slavery and preserved the Union. But as each section grew increasingly committed to its labor system, Americans discovered that accommodation had limits. In 1859, John Brown's militant anti-slavery pushed white Southerners to the edge. In 1860, 
Lincoln's election convinced whites in the Lower South that slavery and the society they had built on it were at risk in the Union, and they seceded. But it remained to be seen whether disunion would mean war.